Um, I'm Bill Maddox. Um, welcome to the SNDP December webinar, Social Enterprise and the Quadruple Bottom Line. I'll introduce our speaker in detail, Drew Tolchin, in just a minute, but I want to give you a couple of um, quick announcements. Um, first of all, several of you are, who are listening today have been uh, part of our webinar series for the last year or maybe the last couple of years. And we are going to continue with the webinar series in 2014, but we're introducing a new collaboration. Um, those of you who've been listening and been interested in the savings group topics, we're happy to announce that beginning in January, a new collaboration with the SEEP Network, Oxfam America, and CARSI uh, will be offering a series of webinars probably once a month on savings group topics. We're going to get deep into uh, a lot of the issues around uh, savings groups from linkages to uh, health to uh, looking at agriculture, a number of other topics. Um, we'll be sending out an announcement to you sometime in early January, and um, these will be uh, in addition to SMDP webinars that we'll be also offering on the kind of broad range of topics that we have offered. Uh, and we'll also have some SMDP webinars that will be uh, multi-session, um, more uh, kind of intense learning events, uh, kind of mini courses. So I'll tell you more about all of that with announcements in early January. So watch your email. Um, I also want to let you know that we are offering the SMDP Ghana um, March 10th to 22nd in Accra. This is a, a microfinance uh, ag uh, development and savings group related program we've done for the past six years with our partners Gamfin in Accra. So please look at the SMDP webpage for that. And also SMDP Togo, which is our French language savings group program uh, in Lome with our partner Maine March 25th through April 4th. So go ahead uh, to the SMDP web page and check those out. Um, all right, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker. Um, our friend uh, Drew Tolchin is uh, the managing partner of Social Enterprise Associates. Um, Drew has been uh, a previous webinar presenter. He actually presented for uh, an entire afternoon uh, back at the SNDP New Hampshire certificate in June, and uh, students in that program really, really enjoyed uh, learning about the work that Social Enterprise Associates is doing. Um, Social Enterprise Associates is a registered B corporation, a firm specializing in enabling entities to do well by doing good. Drew has contributed to 100 business plans and dozens of market studies. His efforts in social, environmental, and community investing have mobilized more than $100 million for triple line returns. His consulting has taken him through the United States and to nearly 40 countries worldwide. He's actually speaking to us from Bogota, Colombia today. Um, and his current engagements include uh, Confluence Philanthropies Initiative Native Green Loan Fund to capitalize a $10 million fund uh, which will increase sustainability of caught and harvested fish uh, with Future, fish, Future of Fish, um, a World Food Program Evaluation on Private Sector Involvement, and a Green U.S. MFI helping low-income people save uh, money through more efficient uh, homes. So I won't go through the rest of his bio. It's up on... Um, the uh, bio page, but we're really excited to have Drew with us today. Apologize for the technical difficulties, and um, I'll turn it over to Drew in just one second. We are going to be doing a, a few polls, so pay attention to polls that come up on your screen. Um, some of you have already been able to find the question box and be able to put questions in, and I appreciate getting the feedback on the sound. Um, as you uh, go through the program, uh, if you do have a question, then please go ahead and ask the question in the question box if it's uh, appropriate to ask it uh, during uh, Drew's presentation, then I will be um, interrupting Drew to do that. But um, other than that, we um, are ready to go. And, and Drew, if you would just um, make your uh, presentation full screen um, so everybody can see it, and um, then we are ready to go. So without further ado, I'm really happy to introduce uh, Drew Tolchin, and he'll be uh, discussing the social enterprise and the quadruple bottom line. Okay. Welcome, Drew. Great. Good morning. Just making checking on sound real quick. Is sound okay, Bill? Yes, it sounds uh, good. Not very loud to me, but it sounds okay. But most importantly, okay. how how does Drew sound to people listening to the webinar out there? Can people? Any chat responses? Same here. Not loud, but good. Sounds good. Okay. I'll make sure uh, you speak up. Then. Good, but quieter than Bill. Okay, so just okay. speak up. We should be good. Great. Okay. Good. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, I wanted to share with you some information on uh, social enterprise and the triple bottom line. 
Um, but we've actually looked past the triple bottom line, now I'm talking about the quadruple bottom line. And in a short period of time, I really just wanted to expose you to a number of ideas. Um, and my theory was that you can start with some new ideas in an hour of, um, of a webinar, and then you can then go and look at things more deeper, or you would be willing to get in touch with Bill or myself. So if I go too fast, please don't be frustrated. It's by design. Um, and we have these slides will be available to you as well as other materials on our website. So hey, Drew? Yes. Uh, could you just please make your um, your screen full screen now? How's there that? We are. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So let's go ahead and also can we start the first poll question, Bill and Daniel? So I want to cover some definitions and theories if people haven't heard of this triple bottom line and quadruple bottom line. Um, and then also want to share some ideas about returns on investment, returns on philanthropy, and then cover what we call in the states earned income strategies, which is just revenue, and then give you some resources. All right, so that's what we hope to do here in the time. So I um, want to make sure that this is pertinent to you in the dialog box, which on my screen is to the right there. Um, you can enter in some information about you. We have a poll. Uh, so we can get some feedback and make sure we're tailoring our remarks to you. And we're interested in um, who you are, what brought you here, uh, and what you want out of the session. And please type in questions at any time. We're happy to stop. It would be much more fun just to do questions and answers that are pertinent to you and your issues and not just have me give a bunch of slides in a webinar. All right? So please give those at any time. Um, Bill gave us an introduction. Um, so here we have the idea of people, profit, and place. Um, just a little bit about uh, us. We're uh, part of a lot of business plan competitions, which might be a good way for you to get attention for some of the work that you're doing. Um, and then uh, Bill mentioned some of our consulting, so I won't mention it here. Uh, we're very pleased to partner with Bill with SEEP Network, which we think is an excellent organization, uh, and many other international NGOs. So some definitions. So first of all, just want to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, when we think about social enterprise, we're talking about directly confronting social needs through products and services, not indirectly with some sort of business practices. Um, there's also a large rise in CSR, which is corporate social responsibility, which is involving the private sector. But we're thinking about social enterprise, we're talking about um, companies and nonprofits and community groups directly serving social needs with tailored products and services. So to us, there's a continuum um, from a charity model, which is grants, to a blended model, all the way to kind of corporate, large corporations doing community-based work. And we're just trying to organize ideas so that you have a sense of where things lie. You have a, a social enterprise is a big tent with different efforts on it, and we want to make sure that um, people have a common understanding. So what's the history of this? Well, social enterprise isn't really that new. If you think about monasteries for hundreds of years, uh, they've been doing this performing arts. If you go to a theater, it's pretty common for you to pay a fee. Um, and that's a form of social enterprise where you're supporting the arts through your money. And then if you want to think about higher education, paying tuition, you're paying for a service that you value. And we want to take that thinking and apply it towards social enterprise and other areas of social efforts. In the United States, in what's called the Gilded Age, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, you had the Carnegie model where people made a fortune and then they gave it away. That was then um, changed in the 1960s in the United States with more of a social service orientation. And obviously Europe and Africa have many different approaches to that. So why is social enterprise needed? I think most of you on this call know this, but we're dealing with uh, lots of people in poverty living on less than $2 a day. In many countries, you have few formal employment options. People are on their own, and so we need civil society to mobilize jobs and income for people. And even in the US, we have poverty on the rise. We have government playing less of a role and we have a nonprofits having to do more with less. And the other reality is that poor people pay more for services, that many of them lack access. So they're paying more for things that everyone else is already paying for, and a higher percentage of their income, and it's taking more time. So let me pause for a moment and check in with Bill, 
and see if we have results from our first poll. While I'm waiting for Bill, um, I wanted to point you towards one of the best articles that I like. It's from a publication called the Stanford Social Innovation Review, or SSIR. And it's a little dated now, but it's Social Entrepreneurship, the Case for Definition. Um, many of you will know Muhammad Yunus. Um, I work for Grameen Foundation. And it, his idea of social business is featured along with Ashoka, Acumen Fund, and many others. And it puts them in a nice context. So that's kind of my best of. So the triple bottom line. Bill, do you want to share any poll results or questions at this moment? Okay. Uh, the triple bottom line, the idea of people, profit, and planet, or the three P's. What is this stuff? Well, a gentleman named John Elkington in 1994 wrote about the idea that we need to get up beyond the bottom line, which is this financial return, and that there's other ways of expressing value and profit. Uh, and so from that idea has grown uh, a social, economic, and environmental returns. So this is a good thing. We have the single bottom line, which is financial profitability, double bottom line, which includes social community elements, the triple bottom line, which includes the environmental impact, and now we're talking about the quadruple bottom line, cultural and faith-based impact, or the fourth dimension. So the quadruple bottom line adds culture and vitality and social equity, where a triple bottom line, the idea that you can return, you can evaluate profit, but that you can also have returns and benefits for other areas. So that's now a fourth P. So we have the three P's, people, profit, planet, and the fourth P of purpose. What are the challenges with this? Well, people will say that spirituality is important or culture is important, but in talk about return, it's very hard to measure faith or culture. And so that's the challenge as we think about the financial value as well as other values for doing this work. We all know that it's worthwhile to have grandma teach her language and her foods to her grandchildren, but how do we show that that should be done and someone should pay for it? That's the question. So let's think about returns. Again, I want to pause for Daniel and Bill to make sure there's no questions at this point um, and make sure that uh, we're good to continue. I think so. In, uh, all right. So in thinking about social enterprise returns, we want to move from the idea that social value and social returns are a substitute for financial return and have it be to a plus and the question is, how do you measure this? So if you do a social enterprise, how do you... Welcome to webinar. Webinar is made easy. And there's an idea of a blended value proposition. This was an idea that's now been around for about 15 years. A gentleman named Jed Emerson um, started it. And we have donations on one side. You have investment. But somewhere in the middle, there's a range where some donation can lead to some return. So this is important for us to think Testing. about, and you can separate or disaggregate the difference in, uh, think of it as a segmentation analysis, where you can have some investment and some donations, and we encourage your projects to be thinking about this. Um, this is a fancy graph. Don't get overwhelmed by it. We're simply trying to show that these things won't happen um, overnight that there's a progression of time for these things, that you to go from self-financing to organizational sustainability or being able to pay for itself to financial sustainability, meaning you can actually return, provide a return. And when you do that progression of time with social enterprise, things are not straight. They're up and down. You may actually lose money or have an expense time, but the purpose of that is to then get a better return over time, this, this top arrow rather than just the business as usual of what would happen anyway in your normal environment. So the, why do you do this? Why do you do social enterprises? Because you want to impact more. You want to reach more. You want to get more capital. You want to make more of an impact to more people. That's the reason. So our goal is to get up here rather than getting here. Getting here, the business as usual case, is fine. You'll have value, but you 
our goal is to get more value. Pausing here to let people catch up here. Again, you're going to get these slides, so you don't have to write this stuff down. So this is a little bit of advanced context. Um, it might not be applicable for all of you. This mm. is something a True. very smart man named George Penick said. And it's the idea of True. risk. Where is risk in philanthropy and in social I'm trying to say one thing How do you evaluate sure. and consider risk when I'm you are sure. putting money? So his argument is that you have the marketplace. The marketplace is complete investment. No, you're, you right? should be good. Wall Street, you should be able to speak into companies, it. things like that. On the far on the right, you have philanthropy. Philanthropy is donations. Therefore, there's no return. Therefore, it should be complete risk. Our argument is that in this middle space of impact investing and in thinking about social value, there is not an equation of risk. So if we are doing a full risk, which is a donation, you should try things that may not work, that might not produce a return for yourself. All right? But a lot of people are so risk adverse because you're worried about losing your donor or you're worried about a um, small, finite amount of money that you don't actually take enough risk. You're not doing enough to create change because you're too oriented toward the market. Is. So that is a question for risk of how you evaluate the financial analysis of how something goes on. So please consider the risk in your program evaluation and where the money goes and the probability of success and what the return is. And again, return doesn't have to be financial return. It can be other economic benefits. For example, you create a bunch of jobs and those people create money or taxes. It can create social value. For example, you help children or, or women with health. It can be the environment. You keep trees from being cut down. You reduce carbon. It can be culture or social or faith you help an indigenous community to maintain its values. All of those are returns. Another continuum when we think about financial risk is which capital are you working from? Philanthropy is up here. It's got high social value, high risk, but no return expectation. Down here you have venture capitalists, you have a full marketplace. There's not much necessarily social value but it's high returns, or there's something in between. Maybe we consider a PRI, which is a foundation loan, or a donor. Um, IFC might be here, right, where they're lending money, but where they're willing to be a little flexible in social value. So we, what a lot of people in the nonprofit field don't do from our experience, although many of you on this call might, is you don't segment different capitals. Capital is capital. Well, all, not all capital is the same. Some capital wants different things, and you need to tailor your communication about what you're doing to that audience. So again, I'm going to pause and give Bill a chance if his speaking uh, works. I'm also going to go look at my chat box you, um, and make sure there's me? no messages uh, that I should, or questions I should be answering. So True. pause for one moment here. No. Okay. So we're a social enterprise in here. So we have a blending between financial return and social value. Um, I don't know if someone might be Skyping, so I'm going to escape out of this PowerPoint for one second and see if, just to make sure that no one's Skyping. Okay. Okay. You can hear me, but I can give you the poll results. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Do you want to type in the poll results real quick? All right. Um, so I think people can see my screen. And Bill, go ahead and type them in. And I will come back to that in just a second. So where does social enterprise fall? So we're thinking about a melding or a mixing of for-profit and non-profit models. We want things to be mission-driven. We want to move away from the idea of charity call a hand up, not a hand out. And the goal is that there can be cost recovery. This might not be complete cost recovery, meaning it might not be profitable, but it wants to have some, okay? And this idea of a blended value, there's a mix of returns. All right, let's go back to Skype, okay? Um, Bill, I'm gonna go ahead and keep going and I'll come back to the Skype in one second, okay? 
So, let's share about earned income strategies. What does that mean? That just means revenue. So, many people have written about this. We're not the only ones. But we suggest a six-point system. And let me check in with Bill before I unravel that. Okay? Um, so, um, the question was, how many of you know about social enterprise? And most of the people responding are saying that they don't, aren't as familiar with it. This is kind of fun. What is he, what is he saying? What is he going to say? <laughs> so it looks like we have a mix of expertise. And so we want to make sure that some of you um, will some of you might uh, some of these might be basic concepts that you know a lot about and some of these may be concepts where you haven't thought about them and so they're new and that's always a challenge with doing a presentation of this type and so we hope to kind of go down the middle as you say in baseball an American expression which means that sometimes some people are going to be a little bored and some people will be a little lost we hope overall it's a good mix uh, and again, these materials are available on the website, socialenterprise.net, under publications, and Bill will have them available through his website. So, earned income strategies, the idea of earning revenue. Might, might not be profitable, but it'll be revenue. So we suggest six steps. Many people say four, or five, or eight, it's fine. But the idea is you can't just jump into earned income right away. You need to think about it and be thoughtful. So what are some of those steps? First is know your organization or the organization that's going to be doing this work. Who are the people? What's the money? What's the knowledge level? And what are our systems? That organizational assessment, you can find example assessments online. One of our favorite libraries is called Idea Encore. So I won't be able to and they can really readily sucks. find them. It's just a yeah. kind of a check checklist that you can fill out. Wrap up or anything like that. A next step that we think is very important is a feasibility study. This is probably more common for a lot of people, especially next year. Neither one of us can. But in our can't study, can't study, what did what we do to make that work before we unplug you and then we? Uh, where the stress points are, where the gap. We, I unplug you and then I mute you and mute you. You want to try that? Do what? We unplug this and then I unmute you and mute you. You want to try that one last time? Threats. SWAT, that's a really good feasibility tool to get you started. Um, and there's also uh, Michael Porter's Five Forces Analysis. Again, all of these are available online if you don't know. Now you need to unmute yourself. The next step is a market analysis. The feasibility study is kind of can you do it? The market analysis is how and what. Organizational assessment is an internal step. Market analysis, we find that a lot of nonprofits say they have a great idea. Say they, they understand something in the marketplace. But it's an internal solution. It's a solution based on what they think and what they want. Have they actually spoken with customers or clients or people? Have you looked at competitors? Have you looked at who else does this? When we say competitors, we mean indirect as well. What are people doing for this for a solution now? There is always competition. It may just be indirect. What is demand for this? Can you prove it? These are important parts of a market analysis that many programs will step over because they think they don't have enough money, they don't have enough time, or they think that, yes, we need it. Then you need some sort of plan. It can't be a business plan. It can't be a strategic plan. We like to think of this as not just a one-time document, but that it's a living document. And that means you're updating it with a work plan, either annually or intermediately, and that you're working from it from an active programmatic standpoint. That's a difference between a lot of people. They'll do a business plan and it'll sit on a shelf. Don't have it sit on a shelf. Use it in your daily activities. Do actual versus projected activities. Next is make sure you've done a budget with projections. Think about the future. We suggest that three years is enough. It doesn't have to be five. And then where are you going to get the money and what type of money is it? Okay, I'm going to switch back and see if Bill's got an update for us. Okay. All right, but Bill's going to test his mic. Can you hear me? Bill? Yes, I can. 
Drew, can you hear me? You can hear me. Oh my gosh, yes, next we solved the problem. Uh, okay. okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, so the poll, um, did you get the results of that poll long ago? I'm showing it right here on my screen right now. I'm hoping people can see it. So some of us know nothing, 20% um, know a little, 40 know a bit, and then 30% know quite a lot. Okay. And do you want to go ahead and run the second poll now? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that, please. Okay, Dan, go ahead and queue up the second poll. All right. Okay, so we won't let this one run as long, but if everyone could answer the question, is your organization or are you directly involved with social enterprise? Easy question, yes or no? Or don't know? We have 41% have voted, 55% have voted, Okay. 62% will get up to 70 and then all right, so um, we can close that poll and see the results. So 80% are involved in social enterprise work of some kind, and 20% aren't, and no one doesn't know. That's good. So. Okay, super. All so right. since we have such a knowledgeable market uh, group, I'd love to hear some questions and hear uh, what people want to what they don't know about, where you have problems and challenges. Bill, can we just have people type thumbs in and then you can interrupt me as we get some of the questions? Sure. I, I only have one question right now, which is I'd like to hear okay. some examples of social enterprises, both winners and losers. So keep that in mind. And uh -huh. I'll, I'll start compiling the rest of the questions and let you know. Great. Okay. Hey, you know, I like that one about losers because no one likes to share, especially in the donor world, something that didn't work, right? I mean, yeah. But, you know, the uh, irony is that to do really good social enterprise, you have right. to fail, fail, because otherwise you're probably not trying hard enough. So we will have some case studies. In fact, I think those are next, pretty soon. Okay. Um, and so thank you for that question. Please ask other questions, even if it's specific to your situation or your country. Um, and then close out these incremental steps. Um, we have a document called the Nonprofit Earned Income Strategies. Uh, and this details this uh, these six points in greater detail. Since most of you have experience, a lot of this is pretty known to you. I think the two things that I would recommend is one, make sure you have an external analysis. Again, a lot of nonprofits or businesses do things internally based on what they know and they're able to do. But if you were to do focus groups, if you're able to do a competitive analysis, that gives you an external place. The second point about that is that a lot of folks I have found in development say, oh no, we're the only ones who do this. Oh no, this is not taken care of in the marketplace. And I'm not always sure that that's true. If you actually talk to the people, finding out they're doing something, it may not be a good solution. It may be a very bad solution. It takes a lot of time. It costs a lot. It's a bad service. But people are doing something to satisfy their needs, just as they're buying Coca-Cola, just as they're watching TV just as they're trying to take care of their family and make ends meet. Um, the second element is down here at six with fundraising and investment is to get different types of capital for different purposes, philanthropy, donors, um, impact investors, and banks, and to do a blended capital to match your blended returns. All right? So I'd like to do a little earned income example real quick. So we do this as a brainstorming list when we do our longer trainings. And think of and write down, take 30 seconds, to write down specific ways that nonprofits and other efforts can earn money and sell a product or to do something. All right? Try to be as inventive as possible. Don't just go for the obvious. And then I'll share with you in a moment the list and um, see anything else. And while we're waiting for people to write things down, I'm going to check back in with Bill to see if we have any other questions. Um, let's see, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. OK. Um, so um, we don't have a question. We have uh, Robin, who is actually part of our team here, says, um, quote, who gives a crap, unquote, toilet paper raises funds for installing toilets in developing countries? Yeah, um, I love that one. Robin, thanks for sharing. I've actually bought that um, before. You can find it online if you're in the United States. So these are folks, they did two things which we really like, and I'm going to get to crowdfunding in a second. In fact, I should probably go to that. Um, they raised money through pre-sales. They had people pre-buy so that, that they could afford to make toilet paper, socially responsible environment.
environmentally sensitive toilet paper. And they sent me a whole box because it's pretty light, so it's cheap to ship. Sent it to my house, and the profits from that they used for de good development purposes. So, the, uh, Robin, that's an excellent example. And it's got a funny name, right, Who Gives a Crap, which is a little crass in um, some places. Uh, but in the United States, I think we like that type of thing. Okay. Um, so let me share this list uh, really quickly. Uh, some of these you're going to know, right? If you have a facility or a place, you can uh, rent it out. Uh, or you can do program service fees or events or you get grants. But there's a couple of items that may be a little less known. Um, some of us who have gained expertise in these areas, because we've been doing this so long, we can then consult and offer our services to others through training. Uh, licensing. We can take an expertise we have or curriculum and ask, charge people to use it. Um, in some cases with certain donor funds that might not be allowed. Um, the other thing that I like to tell people is it, you are an expert. If you're being asked to go to another conference, um, I think it's fair to ask for some sort of compensation, um, particularly if it's to advance somebody else or somebody else is earning money from it. And a lot of us don't ask because we're just so pleased to be invited or we want to share our message. Um, but I think it's worth asking and getting money for the thing. And then the last element is bartering. A lot of us um, are trying to help move people into an economy, but there's no reason why we can't do an exchange of value. Um, and then another one, capital gains, is if we get money, even if it's a little bit of money, to put that in a bank and use it in a mechanism so that it's earning return. So for example, if I get money from a philanthropy a foundation or a donor at the beginning of the year. If I put it into a bank and manage my cash flow, treasury management, I might be able to earn a little bit more out of it. Also, if I time the transfer between one currency to the next. So takeaways from the earned income section. Um, it's going to take twice as long and cost twice as much. So have you run that on your budget to know where you're at and what happens when it does? What problem are you solving? Not just what are you doing, why is it important, but what's the problem? How big is that problem? How big is your solution? How many people need this? If you have a great solution, but it's only going to help 50 people, um, is that good? And if it's a billion people, then how do you differentiate finding those billion to serve? A billion is great, clean water, education, health, and so forth, but which ones are you going after with your solution? What is your special sauce? What makes what you're doing different? And who are the people who are going to do that? So those are my takeaways from the earned income. Okay? Cases, as requested, and examples. Um, in the United States, we have a great institution called Greystone Bakery. Greystone was actually started by some Buddhists in inner city New York in a place called Yonkers. And they started with housing and to start to create solutions for the people in their neighborhood. And they now have five different businesses. They own an apartment building. They own some social services, some health insurance. And what they started doing is they started training people to make brownies, cookies. And those cookies were so yummy that they were uh, ordered by a company called Ben & Jerry's, which is a very well-known ice cream manufacturer in the United States. But they're mission-driven. So they don't hire people to bake brownies. They bake brownies to hire people. So the purpose of the brownies is to motivate their mission to serve their population, which is a lot of people coming out of jails and low-income people in um, Yonkers, in this neighborhood of New York. And one of their HR things is fantastic. They'll hire someone, the guy shows up, and there's not a management, there's not a hierarchy. They have a mentor, and the mentor helps them, but it's uh, an experiential model. So they're supposed to learn, figure out what they do themselves, and then once they learn enough, they then mentor the next person. So it's each one te each one. So not only are they doing the sales thing, not only are they doing the social service thing, but their management structure is kind of based on a Mondragon or a cooperativist network. And this is very important because it's mission driven. Their purpose is to serve people. DC Central Kitchen, this is in Washington, DC. This is a very successful organization, and I bring it up as an example as a local organization. What they did is they had a soup kitchen, so people would show up, thousands of people would show up, and they'd give them a meal. But then what would happen? The next day, a thousand people would show up again. So they started to break that cycle by trying to train people, culinary job training, 
to make the meals and be able to get a meal, but then to also go out and get a job and to get employment. So you took a problem, a food kitchen, a safety net, and you turned that into a job creation using the same mechanism. And they used the same cash flows. They were getting money for emergency food supply. Right? And then they invested that or they spent it in a way to be able to offer returns. So that's taking an existing cash flow, money that would be spent to serve people food, and have it be a replicable or a regenerative way where it's going to lead to a ripple effect to earn returns both for the organization and for the people it serves. Prosperity Candle, it's the holidays. If you're in America, you might look them up. These are some really young folks in New England. And they started off importing candles made by Iraqi women to sell in the United States. They've also worked in the United States with asylees to give them job creation because these ladies have tons of skills. They just don't know the local markets and don't have access. So it's an access solution. Goodwill Industries, again, an American solution, but one that I think is very interesting. This is a $4 billion organization with hundreds of entities uh, throughout the United States that serves 2 million people. It creates employment by opening stores, and those stores are donated items. That may be harder in developing countries, but the idea of having a store with job training, where the goal is job creation and employment, is a very interesting model, particularly in enterprising and entrepreneurial environments, such as the ones uh, that many of us work in. And the idea of helping and subsidizing and supporting the risk to help entrepreneurs then go off and do their own work is why I have this example. 10,000 Villages. Many of you may know this. These, these guys are sourcing and buying handicraft from around the world, and they're selling it in stores in the U.S. I bring this up as an example, one, because of their revenues, but two, because of market access. Um, these guys offer a brokerage to get your products in, in developing countries access into the American market. And in India right now, something I think that is very interesting is that they're starting retail efforts for the more affluent people in India of handcrafted goods. I'm forgetting the names of some of these organizations. Um, Mango, I think, is one that comes to my mind. But in Delhi and in other the cities where you have people who can afford to buy things, uh, having them support their own people in their own communities is a really nice message. Kickstart, this is an African-based entity um, where they are making tools. The folks in these communities are making tools for agriculture and so forth. And the idea is to, again, give people a hand up, not a hand out. And their idea of creating jobs and helping people create replicable tools for sale. BRAC, many of you probably know them. I don't know how many countries they're in right now. But if we think about their history in Bangladesh and also Grameen Foundation, these are some very well-known social enterprises. We might not think of them as social enterprises, but they're universities, they're educational institutions, and they're very varied ways of helping poor people. The milk ladies, the milk processing plants, the milk distribution, these are cooperativist and collective efforts that in my mind are great examples of social impact. And you can see the size of this work, and BRAC is now developing throughout many countries along the world, and I think this is a fantastic example of South-South exchange. Uh, instead of this post-colonial donor environment, you have Bangladeshis going to other countries and sharing what they're doing. So I think this is a very strong case, and these folks are great about replication and sharing it with others. Last one in, in, in uh, India is Selco. These guys have done some great work of employing uh, local folks in Karnataka and, and Gujarat, and then also having a product that is socially valuable with solar panels off the grid to get electricity in homes and rural areas and schools and so forth so that people can have, first of all, clean energy so it's not candles or, or gas or something like that that's harmful for the environment, but they'll also so kids can study at home. And there's a lot of uh, buy, um, a kind of a fallout benefits, if you will, where something that they might not have thought about ends up being a benefit, such as the fact that kids can study later into the night and so can get better grades in school. Bill, I'm going to pause for a moment before my last uh, section, which is emerging topics in social enterprise. Anything we want to hear, uh, questions or things to hear about? 
Sure. Uh, we did have a question from uh, Omar Maruf, uh, which was, could you share some examples of earned income social enterprises, which I think is what you just did. And then a question uh, came up, which you kind of touched on, but it's from Lenny Martinson. And Lenny asks, what is a realistic timeline for when a group will be self-sustaining with a handicraft business? Let's say about 50 w women in rural Uganda. We hope to help them access the market in the U.S. and a few European countries. I realize this is difficult to answer, but an estimate, estimate would be great. No, it's an excellent question, so thank you very much. You know, this is risky. Business and risk is risky. In the United States, the statistic is that 80% of small businesses will either fail or be sold within five years. So if they sell, it doesn't mean that there's a failure. It just means that the entrepreneurs are working so hard that they leave. So these are not easy. Um, the other data is that um, nonprofits, when they're looking at social enterprise, they should be established, they should have strong management, and they should have a steady budget. You should have a regular budget anyway to allow your day or your regular activities to do. And then the, the literature says to do social enterprise as an add-on or as a new element. Um, and the reason for that is because you can't necessarily be an expert at it right, right away. So many companies will take years to get profitability. If we look at something like Amazon in the United States or uh, a technology startup, we're looking at years. But for, for um, there is a choice for profitability for smaller ventures, and that choice is smaller growth, lower growth, and greater profitability, or higher growth and lower profitability. And by that means is that if you're making money and so you want to serve more people, you're going to become less profitable because you're still growing and there's lots of expenses. Those in microfinance know this very well. So you have a choice. The real question is do you have enough revenue to help the ladies and to help yourself so this program can continue? Can you reach sustainability? And we think that within three years you should orient yourself so that you can move from uh, philanthropic support or startup capital to self-sufficiency. Three to five years is what we recommend. Thank you for that question and if there's a follow-up please type it in. So. In the time I have left, I really want to just expose you to some emerging topics in social enterprise. I'm not going to go through them all, so please don't expect me to. Let's also have some more questions, and then we can finish this out um, just past the top of the hour. We want to be true to people's time, but we did start a little late, so we will go past the hour if there's still questions. Okay? Emerging topics that you may or may not know about. Crowdfunding. Largely in the United States and in Europe. Um, I don't know the laws in, United, in, in Europe. But the idea of crowdfunding, bringing together small amounts of money to help um, support something. And the innovation here in crowdfunding is that we're not just going from donations. Crowdfunding is now also starting to do investment. The laws were just changed in the United States. Um, it's not quite clear yet, but it's starting where you can invest. You can get small amounts of money to invest from a large number of people. Crowdfunding is not for everybody, but it could be interesting for some people. Small businesses for small amounts of capital. Kiva Zip is an example. Um, entrepreneurs who wouldn't otherwise qualify for a bank loan, particularly in the United States or in Europe. Uh, early stage ventures that might be high risk. And then pre-sales. And so I think pre-sales is probably most applicable to us in this audience. The idea that you raise money ahead of time so that you can afford your manufacturing. And in exchange, you give people the product or something like that. But to do these things, you need to have access to people. You need to have access to social media and the internet. You won't just be able to put a crowdfunding thing on the website and that'll be it. You need to have access and run a good marketing campaign. Here's some examples. Some of you may know these a lot. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, these are some of the largest. They're certainly here to stay. We've had millions of people use them for billions of dollars. Two facts. These are small amounts of money. The average is $25. And the other thing is that you need a leader, not just yourselves. You need a champion who can go and recruit other people to contribute. Kickstarter, most of the time, most of the money comes through one or two people uh, having access and being champions and being your, in, in uh, Yiddish you say, yenta, one who knows everybody and knows what's going on. The other thing is these things take time. 
they're going to take 40 days, the successful ones, and per the question about uh, the failures, a lot of folks don't get funded. And so you might choose a crowdfunding site that will fund you for whatever you raise rather than only fund you if you reach your goal. You also need to, there's a lot of campaigns out there now, there's lots of noise. You need to be creative, you need to use video, you need to offer some perks or some gifts, and you need to stand out, you need to differentiate yourself. Crowdfunding. Here's another concept, I'm going to blow through these really quick. Social return on investment, or SROI. It's the idea, again, to go back to the blended value, that you can express what you do. Don't get overwhelmed by this thing, but we just want to show that there's a social purpose and a social value, and that creates a cash flow and a cost benefit. Social impact bonds. This is an idea that began in England, where the government supported it, has grown from the United States, and may be valid in other countries. I think it's an interesting concept because it takes a collective need and looks at private financing. So the idea is that if it's going to cost somebody or the government a certain amount of money, that if you use a social impact bond and the government invests at the beginning, then that could save money over the long run. So for example, in the United States, it costs $40,000 to incarcerate someone for a year, and the United States is the most incarcerated country in the world. That's expensive. Somebody pays for that. What if we could create a mechanism to keep people from going to jail? So there's a cash flow that we know about. It's $40,000 a year. If I could prove I could keep somebody out of jail even for just one year, that would save $40,000. So what if I could tell you that it costs $20,000 to perform this service? That's a quote-unquote savings or social value of $20,000 a year. So if we're helping 1,000 people, the math starts to add up. So here's the structure of a social impact bond. The government prepays a bonding issue where private investors will also be involved to get a return. And that money that is raised it goes to service providing. And the government is providing uh, a payment because they're paying less than they would otherwise. All right, And in exchange for that money being provided up front, there's an annuity or a bond payment or a coupon. All right, and so that's a social impact bond. You can see at different um, readmissions rate, this is the, pl the, the police, this is the um, incarceration example I had. The better they do, the program does, the more money that's saved and the more that can be returned to investors. The better the program does, the more valuable it is. So it's a risk-based approach. The worst, the worse. Okay, so you want to align incentives and results. It needs to be results-based. Social business. This is an idea Muhammad Yunus and many others have written about, so I just wanted to share it. In the United States, I wanted to share something called a B Corporation. My company, Social Enterprise Associates, got registered as a B Corporation. If you've ever seen organic food or fair trade or you know that you have to go through a certification process, the B Corporation is the same thing. What I like about it and why I bring it up is they have an assessment program that anyone can use online. It takes a self-assessment. It should take you one hour, and it will show you how socially responsible you are, how good you're doing along a number of categories, and it will make you think about things for your social enterprise you might not have thought about, which is really important. So even though it doesn't have legal standing in the United States, it's still a valuable way to verify what you're doing. So to sum up, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of folks doing this. Some of my favorites are the BID Network, which is out of Holland. They do country-based and international business plan competitions for entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a deadline coming up of the Social Impact Exchange in the United States. I think Skoll does a very good job. Uh, there's another business plan competition called the William James Foundation and a lot more. Clearly so out of the UK. There's plenty of great resources. One of my favorites is Idea Encore. Um, and the impact exchange. If you're in Asia, GIN measures these things. Um, I know something called IRIS, the SE tool belt, and there's a lot of great resources. On our website, we have a bunch of stuff on our publications page, which you can find with some tip sheets, which are shorter pieces, as well as some longer pieces here. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to be in touch, or I'm happy to get deeper follow-up. 
I'm also happy to take other questions now, now and, and afterwards. And again, these materials, as well as the publications that I showed, are available on our website for free. So Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions, and then we've got you for the closing. Great. Uh, thanks, Drew. Um, I don't actually see any new questions. I'm going to just give people uh, another couple of minutes to um, see if um, questions come in. But I, I have a question for you, which is um, you've been doing this work for quite a while now, for probably a better part of a decade, right? Um, yeah, actually longer. I've been doing it for 15 years. I just didn't, it wasn't always called social enterprise. And um, it's it's obvious that there's a, a quite a greater level of interest in the past four or five years, I would say. Um, you know, we would like to think that this is a, a long-term new part of the economy and a new way in which um, commerce and, and um, social problems are going to be solved kind of jointly, but um, what do you, I guess the, the you know you talk about a B corporation, but what what are the kinds of things that governments can do, and um, you know, what are governments do, doing to kind of encourage the creation of of uh, better you know social business, social enterprise um, uh, development, and to to solve some of those social problems? Is there is there some real proactive work being done by governments to encourage uh, this this type of work? Um, so, Bill, I think it's a really great question. I don't know if I can give a short answer. I think I'll give just a brief response, but it could actually be a whole other topic. And I think it's a question of, particularly in our middle-income countries, how do we have government help in beyond just the social safety net? Um, and I think there are three categories where this can be done. Number one is rule of law. If you have good contracts, good faith in investment and in courts, then that helps more investment and more people to participate in the marketplace. So a rule of law. Number two, the thing that's important is for the government to also have metrics for sustainability, metrics for efficiency, and metrics for results. A lot of our government does not. It just throws the money out. And in fact, its purpose is just to spend all its money. If we move to a results-based process, perhaps that will support social enterprise. In some areas, that's not going to make much sense. You know, we still need to provide health. We still need to clean the streets. But even there, you could measure how many people, what's the cost per person served. And there's other ways to add greater efficiencies and operational requirements, which is important. The third is that uh, we as social enterprises and those who want to do social enterprise are lobbying so that our ministries, which are very smart people, understand our issues and can adapt the laws, particularly the tax law, so that it is beneficial and supports this work. If we have Muhammad Yunus's idea of a social business, the idea of you have a business but where the investment capital must go to a mission-driven cause and not necessarily to just help uh, investment investors, you get a different way of behaving. And if we orient our tax code around those, I think we will see more of this happening. Um, I think a lot of social enterprise existed before the term became popular. I think it exists currently in a lot of countries. But just to formalize and have a structured way of doing this efficiently, that may be a little bit new. Okay, great. And you also talked about the social impact bonds, which is obviously a government uh, um, intervention. Um, so I actually do have a few questions now that have just popped up. Um, Corey Trenda um, has asked a question. We've heard. Uh, about some winners, but none that didn't work. Anything you want to say about any of the losers? Yes, thank you for holding me back to that. Um, so there's actually was a study of social enterprise that didn't work. Um, I'm blanking on the name right now, but um, Harvard has done a lot of work on this as a Stanford, um, and so there's a lot of cases that didn't work. Um, so um, Grameen Foundation, Grameen Bank, had a bunch of examples of stuff that didn't work. Um, and obviously not all of it's publicized, but for example, Grameen Foundation tried to um, sell goods from Bangladeshi Grameen Foundation, Grameen Bank clients, and it was a complete failure. Why was it a failure? Well, it wasn't a complete failure. Why was it a failure? It was a failure because you took an expertise, microfinance, and you tried to do something different, which was retail sales. And I would posit that a partnership with something like 10,000 Villages that has the expertise that makes sense. But to have an entity like Kareem Foundation that knows microfinance try to also be an expert 
at retail is not necessarily a good match. Um, in the United States, there also is another example. Greystone had a couple of businesses that I wouldn't say that they failed because their mission was to train people, but they failed in that they weren't financially self-sufficient, and so they had to stop when the funding get out, got out. So you do something, it works, you train people, but then the funding ends and you're done. So that's a failure because there's not a path to sustainability to be able to keep having this stuff keep going. Um, and otherwise, you again, just like a donor project, it's over and it's done and then that's it. Well, I'm kind of tired of that. That's not going to create change. That's just going to maintain. And we need to think about how we create catalytic change and continuation of these efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so Lini Martinson, who asked the, the question about the hand goods um, project in Uganda, has come back and said, thank you for the answer to that question on women doing handicraft in Uganda. Do you have any recommendations for what kind of savings schemes to introduce to rural women with very little, if any, education? I've heard of BSLA, Village Savings and Loan Association, other, other good models. And I'm, I'll be happy to comment after you on this. Um, but go ahead, Drew. Yeah, um, I think that's a question that's far too big for our time here. I would suggest the savings group with SEEP is the place that I would go. I think it's a great question and a great problem. Um, I have seen so many formal and informal savings groups now in many countries that if we couldn't find a SACO or some other savings group mechanism, I would be highly surprised. Bill, you want to take that? Um, yeah, in Uganda there are uh, a number of really uh, robust uh, savings groups models. They're all essentially, uh, if they're um, doing something like a BSLA, the Village Savings and Loan Association, they're all essentially about the same. Um, and um, there are a lot of resources um, in Uganda. Um, an organization works specifically with um, disabled people. CARE is doing a, a major initiative there. PLAN does work there. So, I, Lini, if you would like to contact me afterwards, I'd be able to put you in touch with uh, resources and directly with people in Uganda that might be able, able to help you. But I think um, VSLAs and, and this particular savings groups uh, scheme, which is the Accumulated Savings and Credit Associations, are really ideal for very poor women and might, might work well for this project. Um, so, and then, um, I guess this is really the last question um, that Chris Linder is asking. And um, Chris says, Eunice is very specific that social businesses make absolutely no payouts, no dividends, no returns to investors beyond the initial investment amount. Can you address that on uh, how you think it can work or not and how you operate your own social business? Yeah, Chris, that's a really excellent question. Um, you know, I, again, I worked at Green Foundation, and so my take is that Eunice is putting forward a position uh, to expand the continuum or the space for this. Um, you know, if he were to say, hey, yeah, you know, well, some return's okay, then it wouldn't push us as much. Um, I think it's, his book is fine. I think there's a lot of people who have written about it. My personal take is, again, we need to be blended. We need to be in the middle there. Um, and in the United States, I think the trend supports this through what's called B corporations and B legislation. And the idea is B is for beneficial. And the idea there is that, that you could create your statutes, the charter, the thing that shows why a business is a business, and you can put mission in there so that it's not just all about investors. The American laws are geared towards investors so that if, if someone invests in my company and I'm not maximizing profit, then they can sue me. So what I think is reasonable is to be able to say, you know, my business is going to do some good. We're going to do some volunteer work. We're going to donate to charities. We're not trying to maximize. We're trying to be profitable but not maximize. And so um, the um, – let's go to Bill's comment. Oh, last slide. Sure, I'll do that, Bill. Sorry. Um, so the way we do it is that we're very upfront. We have written in our charter legally – that we will be donating to charity, that if we sell the company, um, part of it will go to set up a foundation, that um, part of our work will be for social good, and so we'll do it for less than it may cost. And these are mission-driven explicit elements that we're then measuring against. And B Corporation, since we're certified, asks us about it every year. And so, Chris, I think that's the place where you create a business that you state the purpose of the business. Just as ExxonMobil wants to get oil, you want to train people and sell handicrafts. 
Um, and so I think that's the path, and that's what's really exciting to me, to have us create a worldwide movement where this is known and there's a space in between capitalism and socialism for actually using the power of the marketplaces as a tool, like a shovel, to do well and to do good, back to our triple and our quadruple bottom lines, to not just earn financial, but also do well for the economics of people, to help social and community efforts, and to help the environment as well as spiritual and cultural uh, well-being. So that's kind of socialenterprise.net's position about this, and we welcome other ideas, and I welcome emails at any time. Bill, any other questions, or over to you. I uh, know that's it. Um, I, Drew, I think this has really been excellent. Uh, despite the late start, I think you really covered a lot of ground, and I uh, appreciate everyone's attentiveness um, during the, um, the past few minutes. I, I do want to point out that uh, Drew's uh, website, socialenterprise.net, is full of resources, and I encourage you to go visit it. Um, as Drew mentioned, we will uh, put his uh, PowerPoint up on the website, and actually the recording uh, from this webinar will be up there, so if you um, want to refer back to it, or um, if um, you know someone else that you'd like to um, be able to learn from what Drew has shared today, then please come back to the SMVP webinar site, and you'll see the recording up there in a few days. Um, again, I want to thank Drew really uh, quite a bit for, for taking time out of I know you're in Columbia on business, and um, we really appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us, and uh, hope that uh, we'll be able to have you back sometime in 2014 to do another webinar with us. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, I'm going to say goodbye to Drew uh, and um, want to just quickly mention to you, as I, as I said before, that we do have upcoming um, webinars on savings groups. There will be more announcements in early January. And I want to let you know about some other special webinars. Uh, you see on the screen the Master of Arts in Development Policy and Practice. This is a master's program that we run here at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, for the Carson Institute. Um, this is a low residency program that we are uh, offering specifically to practitioners. Um, it's uh, low residency, meaning you're here on campus for only four to six weeks, and then you go um, off and, and do online work for two more semesters, and then you come back and finish your project. We are having on uh, December uh, 12th, uh, Thursday, from 12 to 1 Eastern Time, a webinar uh, with Joanne Rivera, who is one of our faculty here to answer your questions about the, the uh, um, Master's in Community Development uh, Practice and plan, Planning Practice, and also on Thursday, January 9th. So you can come to the SMVP um, or CARSI website to sign up for those webinars, and we will be sending notices to our regular uh, mailing about it. And, uh, I encourage you, if you're interested in a really excellent master's program, to please check it out. Um, thank you again for all your attentiveness today and for tuning in to the SMVP uh, webinar series uh, during this past year. We wish you a really uh, healthy and happy uh, holiday season and a, a new year coming up. And we hope you'll join us again in 2014 for these webinars. And uh, thank you for your interest and your commitment to all the good work that everyone does. Thank you. Bye-bye.